Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonalities. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. I'm your host, Bertine Crevacore West, and today I'm especially delighted to have with me special guest, Dr. Pierluigi Mancini. Pierluigi, can you greet our listeners and say hello? Hello, everyone. A pleasure to be here with you today. We are so excited to have you. And, and I want our guests to know, um, Pierluigi and I have known each other for, for some years, and initially we met at a cultural competence conference in Gwinnett County. And we had a spirited debate between us. And I really, I learned a lot from that debate. And and it was great to see a mental health professional speaking about immigrant mental health, mental health of underrepresented communities. So I have been looking forward to having you on the show. And I'm so glad um, that you're able to be on with us today. So I'm going to um, tell our guest a little bit about you. So with over 30 years of experience in culturally and linguistically appropriate behavioral health treatment and prevention, Dr. Mancini is one of the most sought after national and international consultants and speakers on the subject of mental health and addiction. His areas of expertise are immigrant behavioral health and health disparities. His book, which I encourage you all to read, I read it and I very much enjoyed it. It was very insightful. Um, It's called Mental in the Trump Era. 10 Inspirational Stories About Immigrants Overcoming Addiction, Depression, and Anxiety in America. It was recently published to great reviews, not surprising, and it's available in both English and Spanish on Amazon. Dr. Mancini founded Georgia's only Latino behavioral health program in 1999 to serve the immigrant population by providing culturally and linguistically appropriate mental health and addiction treatment and prevention services in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. He's currently serving as the project director for the National Hispanic and Latino Addiction Technology Transfer Center. Dr. Mancini recently led a project to train clinicians in Latin America who are taking care of the over 4 million displaced Venezuelans arriving in Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, Panama, and other countries. A frequent guest of local, national, and international media, Dr. Mancini has been featured in U.S. News and World Report, the Atlanta Journal and Constitution, WAGTV, Channel 5 Atlanta, CNN en Español, Telemundo, and Univision. Additionally, Dr. Mancini has been a favorite and frequent guest of Spanish language radio station. As a national consultant, Dr. Mancini has provided expert content on immigrant behavioral health and cultural and linguistic competency to clients at the local, state, and federal level. As an international consultant, Dr. Mancini has provided guidance, mentorship, and internships to psychology students from the Universidad Anahuac, Mayab in Mereda, Mexico, and has consulted in underage drinking prevention programs in Italy. Dr. Mancini is fluent in Spanish and conversational in Italian, and his public service announcement and documentaries addressing underage drinking, suicide, and prescription drugs has won a combined six Emmys, everyone. Dr. Mancini has been honored with the National Latino Psychological Association Star Vega Distinguished Service Award, the National Council of La Raza, Helen Rodriguez, Frias Award for Health, and the Mental Health America Heroes in the Fight Award, amongst others. Dr. Mancini is the chair of Georgia Behavioral Health Planning and Advisory Council and has recently been appointed to the Mental Health America National Board of Directors. 
He serves as the board of directors of Wellstar Hospital, the Georgia Council on Substance Abuse, and the National Association of Mental Health Planning and Advisory Councils. Once again, the distinguished Dr. Mancini, welcome to our show, Pierluigi. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm delighted to have you. And I really have been looking forward to this for multiple reasons, but primarily I feel that this has become even more timely than it was before, right? I always seem to feel that, um, for me at least, when I look at the state of our immigrant population, our refugee population, our undocumented population, every underrepresented population, I think that mental health is always in a state of emergency. So this is perfect timing, but it was perfect timing a year ago, two years ago, right? So I especially want our listeners to be able to learn from you and our conversation from today and see what actionable steps they can take in helping to not only alleviate the mental health crisis, but play an active role for underrepresented communities. So having said that, I've told our guests a little bit about you, but can you tell me about what propelled you to do this work? Where did it all start? Well, this is a very personal story for me. And I did put some of it in the book because I wanted people to know uh, how personal this is. I am an immigrant. I came to the United States when I was 13 years old. But I'm also a person in long-term recovery from addiction. And I was one of the blessed ones that was able to find help when I was 21 years old. So my addiction, luckily, only lasted three years. So the process of discovery for me started after my treatment. I was finishing a master's degree in international business, and I got a job in a treatment center. And I was working in the intake department uh, while I was finishing a master's degree, and I fell in love with counseling. So after I finished my master's degree, I went back to school and finished a a clinical degrees, and I started being a counselor, and I fell in love with it. And after 10 years of working in, in a residential program where we were helping adults with mental illness and substance use disorders here in Atlanta, friends started coming to me saying, Pierluigi, we have individuals coming to us who have limited English proficiency, who primarily speak Spanish, and there's nowhere in the state of Georgia that we can send them uh, to find help for their illness. Well, I've been type A A personality most of my life, so uh, instead of doing everything that the master's program taught me and and build a business plan and and secure funding, I just said, okay, well, we need to open a program. Uh, I saw a desperate crisis because we we were not talking about one or two people. We were talking about a significant number of people that were being affected. And instead of getting treatment, they were being arrested because of their illness, because there was nowhere else for them to go. So I decided to open up an organization that would provide services in English and in Spanish. And immediately the community responded. People started coming because there was such a need. And that's how the organization that I, that I founded in 1999 uh, started. There was no magic. There was no special sauce. It was the fact that there was a need for linguistic access to behavioral health services. And just by opening an organization that provided that need, the community responded. And immediately people were coming, asking for help. And I was feeling that need. So that organization, it brought challenges with it. Mm-hmm. And which has to do with where, you know, kind of where we are still, unfortunately, because there was such a need, but I couldn't find support, Mm. right? So the first two things I realized is is this was a community that was uninsured. The reason there were so many people in need was because Georgia had received an influx of Spanish speakers that were brought 
to Georgia in the early 90s to build all of the Olympic uh, venues. Yes. Mm -hmm. And from there, people kept coming to work in poultry and carpet construction and everything else. And the size of the community kept growing. So we had more people that needed services, and I couldn't find bilingual clinicians. So these were Spanish speakers who were underinsured or uninsured because they would get paid cash, Mm -hmm. that had families to support. So there was no funding, and I couldn't find enough clinicians. So I started looking for uh, supports, and everywhere I went, foundations, state, individuals, people were very happy that the organization was open and that I was providing these services, but they weren't willing to fund it because there was no outcome studies. Mm -hmm. They wanted evidence that linguistic appropriate services would yield positive results. Right? So to me, it would make sense that if you serve me in my primary language, the mm-hmm. chances that I will understand you are a lot higher. Right. The chances that I will respond to your instructions are a lot higher. But funders wanted some document that would say so. And, and back in 1997, I couldn't find any of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was very little going on around the country, both in services and in research. So it took about 18 months and, you know, I was funding the clinic out of my savings. I just felt such a passion. Uh, It became my full-time work uh, to do that. And I was about to give up and I sat on my desk one night and I said, you know, God, if I heard you wrong, because I thought that I heard a message that I needed to serve this community, Mm -hmm. that I was supposed to use the skills and the talent and the knowledge that I've acquired to serve the limited English proficiency community for behavioral health services. And if I heard you wrong, you know, give me a sign because I can go get another job. You know, here's 18 months of of no income. And I went home that night. And the next morning, I went to my office bright and early, because these were 16 and 18 hour days that that I was pulling. And in my office were five nuns from Sisters of Mercy with a check for $2,500 Wow! and five individuals. And they said, Dr. Mancini, can you please help these individuals? And there were Spanish speakers that needed some counseling. That is fantastic. So since that day, I have never doubted that this is my life mission, Mm -hmm. to make sure that I work as hard as I can to ensure that individuals have equal access and opportunity to Mm -hmm. receive quality service. And we need to eliminate the structural barriers like cultural and linguistic barriers But we also need to respect the cultural context of of each individual. So that's how the organization was born. And for almost 20 years, I watched this grow. And then I found some support. And the first support was a small grant to do my own data gathering and outcome study. Within nine months, we had demonstrated enough that the program was working So additional funding came, we started expanding. I still couldn't find clinicians. So I brought the first two clinicians from Latin America. Wow. So we used the H1B1 visa process, which is a costly process Mm -hmm. uh, to bring individuals. And so we brought two and that's how we started. And then... We had to, we couldn't afford that, like, you know, for long term. So we had to develop a different strategy. So we started developing workforce development strategies. Mm-hmm. And we also started receiving some interest from the prevention field. So we ended up developing an organization that had the 
components of the Institute of Medicine Continuum of Care. It had promotion, prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery. And after 18 years, we ended up with an organization that had 72 employees. It had a full prevention branch, an intervention branch, uh, direct clinical services for children, adolescents, and adults in providing services in English, Spanish, and Portuguese with over 40 uh, licensed bilingual clinicians and three trilingual clinicians. We had our own bilingual psychiatrist, bilingual nurse, bilingual uh, psychiatric physician assistant, bilingual psychologist. So it was a, a full service agency. And we're receiving almost $4 million in, in grants and revenue. And we were serving just in the clinic almost 150 people a day. Oh, my goodness. That's astounding. So it's just a testament of, of what can be done. Mm -hmm. Now, I say all that to say every year was a battle to sustain it. Sure, sure. Uh, because there are people, unfortunately, who don't want those type of services for immigrants and refugees. There are people that continue to put roadblocks, that continue to you know, spread false information that make things more difficult, that distract us from the direct services so we can go put out fires somewhere else. Um, and sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a price to pay because we end up losing funding and services and, and so on. So that's the journey that kind of brought me to that point to be able to develop that. But it was frustrating because after 18 years of me running the organization, there was nothing else that was compatible in Georgia. After 18 and, years. After 18 years. And, and we had won, like you mentioned, we won Emmys because of our bilingual uh, work. We won national recognition from, from federal organizations. We were published in, in research journals. Uh, we received a lot of accolades throughout the years. And we still couldn't find uh, other organizations in the country that were following the same path. And I stepped down in 2016, mm -hmm. and it gave me um, an opportunity to regroup. And through that, some other doors opened up that I was not aware were even there. Mm -hmm. uh, but it gave me an opportunity to follow the same mission at a different platform, at a higher platform. And it gave me access to a different audience, but with the same plan. You know, at the end of the day, what we want is we want professionals who understand the language and understand the culture of people who are today suffering mm -hmm. from mental health conditions, mental illness, and substance use disorders. And because of cultural and linguistic barriers are unable to get the help they need. Sure, sure. Here, Luigi, there's so much I can unpack from that and there are so many gems in there and, and definitely some, some surprising and yet not surprising, you know, parts of that story, right? Um, first, I want to thank you for sharing, especially in your book, your history of recovery, your history of addiction and recovery. And I think it's especially poignant because representation matters. It's important that someone see somebody who looks like them, sometimes speaks the same language as them, is from a similar culture or the same culture as them, and who is now in a position to help so many others share their story. Because then, in that sense, you are a living testament to the power of recovery and treatment. And, and so, you know, I think that's especially important because there's somebody, there are many somebodies, countless somebodies out there that are going through trials and tribulations with their mental health, with addiction, um, with substance abuse, and they can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. So I especially am grateful that you represent that light for them, right? And not only do you 
and the work that you've done so tirelessly um, represent that light, but you also give them an anchor by which to empower themselves to reach that light. And I think that empowers them to not only share information, but teach others that recovery is possible. So through your example, you're creating other examples. And I commend you for that. And, and I know that, you know, it may not always feel like it, but we are grateful for that. You know, even people that you've not met yet will benefit because you've helped their relatives or their friend, you know, or their coworker or their employee. So services like this are so, such, such an essential part of society. And, and I feel that it's overlooked too often. And that you displayed when you were talking about, you know, of course this is going to work. What is, what is it that, um, I'm paraphrasing that Nelson Mandela quote, but if you speak to, to a man in his, in a language that in he language, understands, it goes to his head. Exactly. But if you speak to him in his language, it goes to his heart. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in my work, um, as you know, um, we met when I was an interpreter and I've retired from interpreting since then because the work has broadened itself and taken me into other avenues where I can I can help more people. Right. And this is a part of that, I think. So I remember that I had a, a patient who had experienced um, a stroke. And he'd been flown in um, during the earthquake, um, after the earthquake that happened in Haiti. And, you know, when he saw me, and this was a man that was fully trilingual prior to his stroke. And um, he was fluent in English, lived in the United States for many years, and he had moved back to Haiti to open an orphanage. And he was a professional, highly educated person. And when he saw me um, and heard me speak in Creole, his eyes just lit up in a way that that I know you've seen before and it's hard for me to describe to people who haven't seen that, no. right? And, and he had this automatic reaction and, and that's when I knew that the work I was doing was worthy because I was helping someone in a language that they understood. And even um, there was a time where I had a mental health interpreting encounter with uh, a psychologist who didn't speak um, a foreign language. They only spoke English. They were monolingual. And that in and of itself wasn't bad, but they were, their patient was a young girl who was dealing with some trauma and she didn't speak English at all. And so I thought to myself, this has got to be, you know, a very odd situation for her, especially as that provider was male. And culturally, um, that's a very intimate space where you don't necessarily talk about your feelings with a stranger of an opposite gender. Who, and now you can't even talk to them without an interpreter that you're just now meeting. You know, so it's, there are so many puzzle pieces to that. And I just think it's important that we do have representation for people so they can be free to express themselves and even get over those cultural barriers that even in their same language situation would have prevented them from seeking care, right? Because I think unfortunately in many, many cultures, on my own included, that people see seeking mental health as a weakness when honestly, if your arm was bleeding blood profusely, you'd go to a hospital to right. get there. So if, if you're experiencing any sort of other trauma apart from physical trauma, why not seek care for that? And I find that that's a challenge that I see happening often because people don't, don't equate the two to be the same, right? And so I also loved, as you were saying, about support because good work can only go so far without support, right? And, and in this country in particular, um, money is what's behind everything. Um, either, I always say, I try to support people through my, my time or my treasure, right? Whatever I can. And I think when we don't have those two things together, there are lots of programs that just simply can't sustain themselves. So I love your story about the nuns just being there, I mean, talk about getting a direct answer to your question, right? Right, <laughs> so I know. I love that. that. That's very fortuitous. So talk to me then about, because we're talking about mental health as in the nation, but how would you describe the state of the nation's collective mental health today from your uh, perspective? We've got some exciting news here at the Global Fluency Podcast. As your safety and continued learning remains our top priority, the 2020 Global Fluency Diversity and Inclusion Summit has gone virtual. The Global Fluency Podcast and Westbridge Solutions continue to see this as a time for growth and evolution. 
Take this opportunity to come join us virtually for our 2020 summit from the comfort of your own home. Going virtual has allowed us to offer all summit attendees tons of additional perks. When you register for the summit, you will receive access to all 12 of our key speakers during this live two-day summit, no need to choose breakout sessions, 30-day access to the replay of the summit with closed captions, eligibility for SHRM, CCHI, NBCMI, and LPCA CEU credits, and for nonprofit organizations and interpreters, you will receive a special discount when you use code GF202045. Don't delay. Register today at www.globalfluencysummit.com. We look forward to seeing you at the virtual event. I think we're hurting. You know, the, the, the country is hurting emotionally. It began, the, the entire year we've been hurting. It began with COVID-19. It began with social isolation. We saw increased numbers of anxiety and depression. We saw people who had been receiving treatment, counseling that was interrupted because programs had to close. Clinicians were not able to see people in person. There was a a learning curve for telecounseling to open up, you know, national rules and policies had to be implemented to allow clinicians to see individuals through telecounseling. Prescription exceptions had to be implemented for uh, physicians to be able to write prescriptions either electronically or for longer periods of time for some individuals with uh, in, in some substance use disorder treatment. So it began with that. So we were already uh, emotionally hurting when we saw the uh, brutality of the murder on TV and the racially charged protests uh, because of, of George. And it brought even more angst and pain to a country that, that was already in pain. So what that does to, to behavioral health, we had already realized that we did not have enough clinicians to take care of, of the pain and, and the issues that we we're facing with COVID-19. All of the pain that, that we're suffering now, we still have a shortage of clinicians. Uh, we do seem to have a better understanding of mental health conditions. In, in some ways, there seems to be an understanding of, of less fear of saying I'm, I'm depressed or I'm anxious. And, but we still have a long way to go because opposite to someone who has found successful recovery from cancer or from another chronic illness, we still don't have the number of individuals who have successfully recovered from depression or anxiety coming out to speak that truth. And the reality is that uh, treatment, both talk therapy and pharmacology for mental illness and substance use disorder, has come a very long way, and millions of people are living successful lives in recovery because they did receive the help that they needed to receive. And the challenge that we find ourselves in is that we don't talk about our success. The reason I self-disclose my recovery for, for the last 35 years I've been in recovery is because if I don't tell people, hey, treatment worked for me and recovery works, then how are people supposed to break that negative stigma that if you develop a substance use disorder, you are doomed for the rest of your life to always be a drunk and to always be an addict and to have all those negative words associated with what is an illness? We don't call someone with cancer a negative term. We give them compassion. 
right? But with someone that develops a substance use disorder, we give them negative terms. Someone that develops a mental illness, we give them negative terms. And the very few times that we see mental illness and substance use disorder in the news, it's usually associated with some horrific crime. Yeah. So we need to make all those changes. So, you know, the country right now is still in pain. We do need to let people know and, and we continue to post the helplines, the disaster helplines, the uh, mental health helplines and text, um, also by text in English and in Spanish, and the suicide helplines in English and in Spanish. Because what we want people to know is that there are people available that can talk to you and you can reach out and talk to someone. But right now, you know, we seem to understand more about it, but we do have, especially if you have limited English proficiency, mm -hmm. we have tremendous barriers of availability, affordability, and accessibility for treatment. I really like that you brought up doing away with the stigma and the culture of shame because we do tend to criminalize as a society people dealing with mental illness. And one of the, while I was reading your book, one of the just constant messages that I saw was the use of positive terminology, right? Changing that. Because with each story, and I love the perspective, because it was telling, and I'm not giving away the book too much because I want you guys out there listening to purchase the book and to read the book for yourselves um, because it does take you through a journey of several individuals. And when you were describing their treatment plans, right, I thought to myself, this is so simple, not easy, but simple insofar as what steps we can take because I like actionable items. And so it was a simple list of things that, helped people from really disastrous and potentially life-threatening situations. And so I, I, that part about changing the real, the negative negativity real in your head, that part to me is, it resonates deeply with me because, you know, in a business school, we would call that a confidence class, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I said, you know, why don't we do that? Why don't we encourage people to do that? And, and I believe for me, um, intentionality with our words is, is a vital part of not only our mental health, but our physical health. Because when we are mentally going through trauma, that affects our physical bodies. And so I love seeing that, that theme throughout the book because it showed you what steps you can take as an individual to continue that process of recovery, even after, let's say, you're, I don't know if the word's done with therapy. I don't know if that's appropriate per se to use as a term, but when, let's say, you feel like you've concluded your therapeutic treatment, these are steps that you can do every day that are simple to do, just as we would get up, take a shower and brush our teeth, right? right. Let yourself positive affirmations, change your mental, that movie reel that's going through right. your head, right? And, and I think that's so powerful because in many, many cultures, people aren't taught that, particularly women, right? right. And so I think it's one of those things that empowers people uh, to really be proactive in their own health, right? Right. And, and health. You know, let me, let me interject something that's very important that you said. When we talk about being done with therapy, mm -hmm. you know, we don't say that about physical health. Right. I'm, ne I'm never done with my primary health phys physician. Right. You know, I go see my doctor every year for an annual physical, you know, if I get a, a if I get a cold or if I don't feel well, my stomach hurts, I go see the doctor. Mm -hmm. And if in six months my stomach hurts again, I go see the doctor again. Absolutely. Well, therapy can be the same thing. You know, if I'm feeling anxious, if I'm feeling depressed, if I'm having, you know, some difficulty, I can go see my therapist. Maybe I'll see my therapist for six weeks or ten weeks, and then we stop. You know, once I've overcome whatever issue. I'm having, I can stop. And then if something else comes up, I can go back. Right. Now, there are some illnesses that, that require some ongoing therapy and some ongoing medication, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Just like there are some physical uh, illnesses that require, you know, monthly visits to the doctor and, and monthly medicines and things like that. So we need to stop separating these two 
and look at us as entirely uh, a, a process of health maintenance. Thank you for sharing that because I will admit I I didn't have a term for that because there's I didn't you know I simply didn't know what that would look like right because um I have friends and and colleagues and loved ones um who are in therapy and some of them have stopped going and then one of them you know she did exactly what you described she goes for a certain amount of time and then when she feels that she's gotten what she needs to empower herself to continue on that path of good mental health, then she takes a break. And I thought to myself, that's very interesting because we don't have terms for that, right? Because I think if, similar to what you said, if I'm not feeling well, then why wouldn't I seek help, right? Right. Whenever that occurs. Even, you know, I don't want to make light, but when my son was first born, I was a very nervous parent because I was the youngest child in, in my family. I was the youngest girl. And my husband's an only child. And so if this child had a broken nail, we would call the pediatrician. And and by then she knew that we were calling about random things. And, And I think to myself, we need to have that same kind of expediency when we're feeling a particular way, right? Especially as you mentioned with COVID um, right now, um, we're dealing with not only a global pandemic, but we're also dealing with um, educating our children online. We're dealing with pivoting our work um, and the manner in which we work. We're, we're dealing with personal and professional challenges. And, and, and that is in addition to the real life that we were dealing with prior. And I think to myself, you know, for me, I know that that was particularly stressful the first two weeks because I I am a regimented person insofar as, you know, I like processes, right? I like a schedule and, you know, and my child also likes a schedule. Nice. And so, and I think we crave that, right? And, and you can be flexible within that schedule, but what are we doing this morning and how are we doing it, right? right. And even technological challenges. I would see this in meetings where, you know, some people's cameras wouldn't be working, um, and, and then the, the systemic technological challenges, meaning that, you know, the organization or company didn't have a platform set up yet because no one expected this. So right. all of those challenges are added stressors all the time. And I was thinking to myself, what are people doing and, and what type of self-care are people doing? Because I don't even know that many people are aware that they're struggling right? They're not even sure, but something's different. Right. And for me, I know those first two weeks, I was just like, how are we balancing this? What are we going to do? Because we need to ensure that, you know, our sanity, the sanity of our child, and I, I don't use the term sanity uh, in jest at all. Our literal well-being had to be a priority. And, and how are we going to deal with this? And then people are thinking about the financial aspects, uh, right. because now, how many, I think it's 40 million people in the United States are out of work just like that. Right. What do we do with that? And then if you're dealing with substance abuse, homelessness, um, being a limited English proficiency person, just it's one trauma stacked on top of another. And then when you mentioned the access or lack thereof that people were experiencing, you know, now we have to worry about, you know, being extra diligent about hygiene, but how do you do that? If you can't afford a place to live, but also how do you do that if you are living in a domestically violent situation as is? And, right. and you know that, you know, what if you're undocumented? Who are you going to go to for help? So all of those things, I kept wondering to myself, what are people doing to make sure that they are okay? Not only for their families, but for themselves. So I'm glad that you mentioned having access to care because it's it's such a big deal. And telehealth now we've seen has just you know, skyrocketed, which I'm grateful for, but there was that learning curve, right? For the clinicians, as well as for the people subscribing to it. And then we have to think about what about internet access? What if you don't have that, you know? So there are so many things that I think we weren't prepared for, you know, from a mental health standpoint with the onset of COVID, but it's also shined a light on not only the inequities that exist, but on just how broken the system actually was. And it gives us an opportunity to now be better, right? And that's what I'm hoping will come out of just us having this discussion, just so we can see the challenges that many people face and where can we plug in to really just help improve something that was already 
not fully functional and accessible at best, right? And so I want to ask you then, what unique mental challenges do you think immigrants and refugees face in the United States specifically? And how is that different from the mental health challenges that undocumented people face? Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. So the first thing to take into account is immigrants come to the United States with a much higher level of mental wellness than the general population. And it's been documented that the longer immigrants are in the United States, the worse their mental health gets. Wow. So, yes. That's shocking. Um, it is. And when you think about it, in many other parts of the world, we don't live by the clock like we live here in the United States. Yes. Life moves a lot different. Mm -hmm. And we have so many deadlines and stressors. And if you want to be part of the American dream, then, you know, how much can you accumulate? And all of those comparisons to what your neighbor has uh, it start infiltrating the life of many immigrants, and that you know adds to the to the challenge of their mental health deteriorating. At the same time, immigrants come to the United States in many ways. You have immigrants that come in because of relocation from their job. They have all their paperwork in order. They come in uh, in an airplane. They have a, already a house, and they have money in the bank. Then you have immigrants that come in and they, you know, they have documentation, They, but they sold everything in their home country to make a new start here. They don't have a lot. They, they have very humble beginnings and they may not have a job to start with. So they have the struggles. And then you have undocumented, which, as you know, can mean so many things. Mm -hmm. It can mean that someone came in without permission, but it can also mean that someone came in with permission that expired, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So even undocumented, you can have rich undocumented and poor undocumented. Mm -hmm. So undocumented can have two or more different stories about what their challenges are. So it depends where you are on that spectrum that you're going to have different experiences and uh, when it comes to your mental health. Because each one of those areas on the spectrum is going to give you different access to mental health services. So if you're an immigrant that comes in and you are quickly assimilated and you understand how the system works and you have documentation or health insurance and you have access to uh, counseling and clinicians, then you're going to be able to get help for whatever reason uh, you need to, to seek help for. But if you don't have insurance or if you don't have documentation, many states pass laws that in order for you to access, and, and Georgia is one of those, mm -hmm. in order for you to access public services, you have to show, demonstrate lawful presence. Uh -huh. So for you to access public mental health services in the state of Georgia, you have to show your papers to that facility. So if you're an undocumented immigrant, you can access those services. So your only option then is to pay cash at a private agency because you can't even pay cash at a state-funded agency. 
they, they cannot accept you even if you pay cash. So it leaves only uh, paying cash to a private agency. And what happens? Private agencies end up charging a lot of money. Yes, indeed. To which already leave, a cash-strapped population. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Which leaves a lot of them unable to get help. So what are the issues that they bring? Well, undocumented immigrants that come in without permission face the trauma from the journey, uh, whether they come uh, crossing the border or smuggled in some other way. Uh, a lot of bad things happen during that journey. Mm-hmm. And you have children and you have elders, and that compounds the problem of, of their of their issues. So they'll arrive at their final destination already with some trauma in their pocket. Mm -hmm. And then you have the adjustment problems. Do you adjust to work? Do you need to find work? Can you find work? You have school issues. If you're a young person, every young person has to go to school, whether you're documented or undocumented, the school has to take you. Mm -hmm. So what is the adjustment process? Many of the youth are being placed uh, in their grade level based on their age, not on their academic knowledge. So you may have a 15-year-old being placed on ninth grade, but maybe they only have a sixth grade education. So that is a a tremendous amount of stress. You have uh, social barriers that they face in the communities that they move into. Uh, Are they going to be welcomed? Are they not going to be welcomed? So the barriers vary from them, but there are some that are pretty standard. Most of the time, discrimination, racism, prejudice are pretty standard uh, that are faced in, in many communities by mm-hmm. immigrants and refugees. If you dress different, if you speak with an accent, if you eat foods that smell different or look different, there are many communities that immediately want to discriminate against you. And we're faced that the last few years at a higher level than we have in this country. And then there is also a lot of the policies and fears that not necessarily have to be true, but they get mentioned in the news. And that causes a lot of panic in immigrant communities, like the whole discussion about the public charge. And that created so much fear that actually left many immigrants and refugees who were eligible for public services, but decided not to use them because they had fears that they were going to lose their permanent residence or they were not going to be able to apply for citizenship. Both of those things are false, but the narrative that made it into their communities um, was so scary that they decided to forego some of those things, including medical treatment for some conditions that they were eligible for. And that's so, a very difficult decision to make. I mean, either my my health, my mental health, uh, which at this point we know is our health, right? Versus, you know, my safety. And I think that, you know, especially now with COVID too, and some of these archaic and quite honestly, illogical policies that and, and misinformation that we're seeing spread around, it's potentially lethal, I think, to people because this this sort of, you know, anecdotally, you know, you're going to hear something and you're going to be scared and you're going to tell your neighbor so you guys can be prepared and safe. But even here, um, I think when you mentioned the the spectrum of immigrants that that are in the United States, I myself have had very close friends who one of them was visiting my home and she said to me, you know, I'm going to leave a little earlier because ice is out and, you know, I know they're going to pull me over. And this is somebody who is a U.S. citizen. And, and, you know, it's, and I, that, that saddens my heart deeply for anyone, for everyone experiencing that. Um, Even myself, looking the way I do, having the last name that I have, speaking different languages, eating different food, I know that when I walk into a particular space, I'm perceived differently and I'm dealt with differently. And so that's the armor that we always have to put up. And I thought to myself, this is America. This should not even have to happen. Um, But then I thought, this is America and this is what happens. And so how do we deal with that? 
that cognitive dissonance that we're experiencing because that in and of itself is traumatic as well. And we're two people with a high level of education who are multilingual and able to be bicultural, a multicultural for that matter, and, and, you know, kind of make that shift from one, you know, cultural persona to another, right? And we're, we're culturally fluid. And so what if you are not that person that is? So that adjustment period that you mentioned, right? And particularly what I find interesting is when you talked about children, because I have seen this problem occur and it is mind boggling to me. Um, and off air, we were talking about friends that we would have um, from Kosovo and you're planning a trip there. And I remember um, when I was in college, one of my classmates was talking about her experience and coming from Serbia, and, and this was, you know, shortly after the war. And she was saying to me how she was just dropped into this country and she was grateful to be here. We all are, you know, well, I can't speak on behalf of every single person here, but let's make that assumption, right? So she was grateful to be here, but she was placed in, she had just come out of a war zone and now she was expected to pass her SATs. And she didn't have SATs, right? We all have different tests that we take, but you know, you're plucking somebody from a traumatic situation, placing them in a place where they don't even, you know, you may not even be familiar with the system of education. You know, I've right. even seen people that back in my interpreting days, the idea of a health insurance card is a foreign concept. Right. And for some reason, the providers that I was dealing with, because they weren't exposed to other cultures and systemic practices of other cultures and other countries, they were baffled by why is this a big deal? Just give your insurance card and go see three people before you see the doctor and then this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, you have to break down those steps and procedures because if I've never seen this card, it has no meaning to me. It has no value to me. So right. how do we integrate into the complex healthcare system that exists here? Whereas in right. another country, my doctor would come to my house or I would go visit them and you knew who they were, you know? So even things like that, when you mentioned adjustment, all of that went through my head because there are so many steps. But I think in order for us to be allies, these are what we need to do. We need to explain these steps to people. So that requires... Quite honestly, I would say, um, and you tell me if you disagree or not, but it requires a, a great deal of cultural empathy from us, right? right? right. Um, I feel like we we tend to be very fast moving here in, in the U.S. And what you said about time resonates with me deeply because my family approaches time differently depending on whether they were born here or whether they were born and raised in Haiti. So. Right. Time around the world and many other countries, even um, countries that are that are considered first world countries, they time is cyclical, right? I mean, it's um, circular. And right. in the United States, it's very linear. Right. And, you know, if you're not here at 9.15, then your appointment is canceled. Right. Goes to, okay, I'm going to be there. It's going to happen. And then we'll go, you know, the day will go on. And right. I just think to myself, that is a huge barrier in and of itself because a lot of LEP patients have to cancel like their day of work. They have to take a day off right. to an appointment. And if they're 15 minutes late, there goes right. the wages. And and the I've seen the look of people simply not understand that and see it as an injustice. And then we have to explain, well, here, if you miss this time frame, you have to reschedule. And that might be a month from now. Right. You know? So it's particularly I, I think as great as the challenges are that we see before us, the honest is upon people who are familiar with the system to be culturally empathetic and right. to help lay out those steps for people to, to really serve as allies. Because I think we can say, yeah, be an ally, but what does that look like, right? right. It changes with your, your line of work. So if right. I'm the receptionist at a medical clinic, I need to know that this person you know, may not speak English as their first language. So do we have documentation in another language? Do we have clinicians in another language? And the challenge that you mentioned with clinicians who are multilingual and, and bilingual, that to me is astounding simply because we live in the United States, a place that is full of multilingual people. And so I wonder why, what, what pathways and, and I'm not expecting you to answer this, but I just want to put that out there for us to ponder what pathways 
of recruitment are we considering when people go to medical school, when people learn to become counselors, when people learn to work in any aspect of the mental health field? Are we looking, because the traditional pathway isn't serving us well, right? Right. Um, So what can we do to just look for diverse pools of talent that already are here, right? right? And so again, this is why I say representation matters because I think when people see you, you know, that young person that's thinking about what they want to do with their lives, this may be a good example um, for them. I'm certain that it will be on, here's another career choice. Here's where you can add value. Here's where you can capitalize on your linguistic skills. Yeah. So hopefully we're able to, hopefully we'll be able to, I think COVID will help us come out better, hopefully. Well, I think, you know, there's so many things. Um, It all begins with me. Mm -hmm. You know, it all begins with me. I need to get to know me. I need to get to know what my prejudice, what my biases are. If I'm going to be an advocate, if I'm going to be an ally, if I'm going to help somebody. And it goes the same thing for how do I develop the workforce? If I'm going to help um, discover, recruit, uh, increase the number of bilingual folks, it all begins with me. Because I think one of the um, issues that continues to come to light uh, is that we all have implicit bias. We all have hidden bias. Mm-hmm. Uh, the reality is we're, we're a product of, of, of our environment. We're a product of the people that we grew up around. And we're a product of, of the education and, and the things we read. Unless someone tells me different, how am I supposed to know that what I've learned and what I've read and what I've seen is not the right thing or the proper thing, mm-hmm. right? Someone has to catch that or show me or, or I need to see. Well, I think that we are putting enough of that today out in, in the general public that people do understand that there are many things that have been taught that are wrong, that the system does need an overhaul, that history needs to be rewritten and the the right information needs to be uh, put out there. But it all begins with me. I need to do that inside work. You know, cultural competence is an inside job. And a job means that there's action associated to it. So if I don't do the work, then I'm not being competent. I'm not working towards competence. And in order for me to do that, I do need to take an inside look at myself and I need to take a clear look. Otherwise, it's going to be real difficult for me to stand up and be out there and say, hey, I want to be a champion for this. I want to help move the uh, limited English proficient cultural linguistic competence issues that are present today in the behavioral health field. There are many, many, many well-intentioned, lovely people in behavioral health all over the country Mm -hmm. at all levels, local, state, federal, private, everywhere, lovely, well-meaning people. And many of them just do not know uh, what it is that they need to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, others, even when they are told or presented with a plan of action, they are unable to implement that plan of action because they lack the inside work that they need to do. There's nothing more frustrating than you having trained the line staff, the boots on the ground staff on on how to be cultural, linguistically competent, how to take care of the individual. And they come up with a beautiful plan on how to make your organization better and they shoot it upstairs to management, and management is clueless, so they shoot it down. They they don't approve it because they have no idea, because they haven't had the training, they haven't had the inside work, they don't know themselves. Uh, So it all begins with me. I need to be able to know what my hidden biases, what my prejudices are in order for me to be able to, to contribute. I love that, Pierre Luigi, that cultural competence is an inside job. I really do. And, and I share your frustration in that, where you do exert the time, the energy, the 
the the work you put it in to train a particular staff and then nothing right i have to believe that again if we are culturally empathetic and this includes with ourselves you know we really need to do that inside work so we're going to wrap up our discussion now but tell me two things that you'd like to impart upon our listeners well, besides cultural competence is an inside job, you know, I invite everyone to to do that work. I really would like to invite all our listeners to find your voice. We all have a voice. We all have a reason, a purpose that you're listening to this podcast, that you're doing the work that you're doing, that you're passionate about uh, helping others. We need to find our voice. And the voice is, is within us. Right. We just need to make sure we find it. But here's the key. When you find your voice, when you find your voice, when you hear messages like you've heard today, then it becomes your obligation to use your voice. It is bigger than a responsibility. It's an obligation to use your voice because you may be the only person in a meeting, in a gathering, in a position of authority that has the knowledge necessary to speak up and say, wait a minute, have we thought about how this will impact X community? Or have we thought about adding this section in order to increase the number of people and help this community? Or you may be the only one with the information to say, wait a minute, this is wrong. If we do this, it's going to hurt this community. So find your voice. And when you find your voice, use your voice. Wonderful. So find your voice and use your voice. Thank you, Pierre Luigi. And can you tell us where can people find you if they want to get in contact with you, follow your work, purchase your book? Tell us where we can find you on social media. Thank you. So I, I have a, a web page at ldrmancini.com, E-L-D-O-C-T-O-R-M-A-N-C-I-N-I.com. And the same tag, L. Dr. Mancini, is what I use for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Wonderful, wonderful. Pierre Luigi, I cannot thank you enough for being a part of our show today. I appreciate you, your time and your work for every community. So thank you so much for being a part of the show. And for all of our listeners out there, remember, this is your podcast. We want to hear what you think about this episode. Um, I know that it will be empowering for you to hear. And, and I also encourage you to continue the conversation after you've heard this episode um, with somebody that that you know, or through your virtual water cooler experience. So continue this conversation so you can not only empower yourself to use your voice, but empower others to use theirs. So on behalf of the Global Fluency Podcast and our special guest, Dr. Pierre Luigi Mancini, I'm Bertine Krebacher West, and I thank you for tuning in to the Global Fluency Podcast. Let's remember to keep the conversation going. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going. Going.